and people are coming in. Okay, welcome everyone. Just going to give a um, couple of minutes for, for everyone to come in. People are gradually arriving. Thank you all for coming. Okay, well, um, the the participant numbers seem to have reached more or less a plateau. So, and it's a few minutes past. So, I think it's a uh, a good time to get going. Uh, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, you, this um, is the launch for um, a new report published by CAT and Demilitarize Education or Deducation. Um, called Weaponizing Universities, Research Collaborations Between um, universe, UK Universities and the Military Industrial Complex. Uh, it's just been published online on the CAT website today. Um, and uh, my colleague Katie will hopefully be posting that link in the chat. Um, okay, um, so the report's been written by um, a copy uh, Ajanye, yes, that we do have the questions and answers at least. Um, so, a copy, a copy is a freelance research officer with Demilitarized Education. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in international relations and a master's degree in economic history from Stockholm University, and another master's in security studies from University College London. His main research interests are militarism and peace movements. Um, he's interned with Plan International, a global NGO advancing children's rights, and Humanium Metal from IM Swedish Development Partner, who combat gun violence by transforming illegally um, illegal seized firearms into peaceful commodities. Uh, he has also applied and received funding to research the attitudes of STEM university students towards careers in the military industrial sector. Um, so, uh, um, a copy, a copy will, uh, speak for about 15 minutes to present the report. It's, I just got to say, I've been working with a copy, uh, as he's been writing it, it is really incredible. It covers so much ground, um, and pr provides so much information and analysis and ideas, um, that, that uh, I, I will only be able to touch on uh, in this webinar. So please do um, read the full report if, if you can. Um, after a copy, we'll have our panelists speaking. First of all, um, uh, Andy Sterling, who is Professor of Science and Technology Policy at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex, where he co-directed the STEP Centre for 16 years, working on issues of power, uncertainty and diversity in science and technology, especially around energy and biotech. He has served on a number of UK, EU and wider governmental advisory committees, including presently as a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, then we will have um, Victoria Araj, uh, so, um, if I can just find my notes, um, uh, it's somewhere in the chat, uh, apologies, um, Here we are. Victoria is a lecturer in equality, diversity and inclusion at the Eleanor Glanville Institute, University of Lincoln. Uh, outside academia, Victoria has worked with Carnegie Middle East Center, Cambridge Center for Palestine Studies, and also with a number of UK and Turkey based refugee and peace education charities. She is an active member of Palestine Solidarity Campaign and the University and College Workers for Palestine Network. 
Victoria holds a PhD in Peace Studies from the University of Bradford, and her current research project is on conscientious objectors, CND, and the history of the peace movement in Lincolnshire. And last but not least, um, River Butterworth will speak. They are postgraduate officer at the University of Nottingham Student Union and um, a, uh, an organizer for Demilitarized University of Nottingham and a um, general troublemaker, I think it's fair to say, in the best possible way. Um, so uh, with further ado, I'll pass on to Akopi to um, talk about the report. And after everyone's spoken, of course, there'll be a time for questions and answers. So if you have questions, do post them in the Q&A. Yes, I just wanna first thank everyone for being here. And um, before I speak on this report, I feel like I have to thank um, the many amazing peace organizations out there and all the work that they've done on this topic, because in a lot of ways, I'm just building on the foundation that has been set by those previous organizations. As you read, as you read the report, you'll notice I refer to um, brilliant organizations like Drone Wars, Campaign to Stop Killer Robots, and Science is Global Responsibility. And um, so I just want to <laughs> sort of um, extend my gratitude to their work, as well as to our uh, great volunteers in demilitarized education. Um, a lot of their, uh, this report would not have been possible without their contributions, as well as my own uh, teammates in demilitarized education. So um, I've often felt like this work is um, just as much um, theirs <laughs> as it is mine in, lo in lots of ways. And also, uh, uh, finally, of course, uh, campaign against arms trade um, is also an eternally grateful for this opportunity to write this report. And um, so on that note, I will um, talk about the report and just provide like a brief um, overview of the topics covered in the report. So um, the topic of the report, um, broadly speaking, is about the military industrial academic complex. And this refers to an alliance between uh, universities on the one hand and arms companies and the military establishments. And um, basically this entity, the military industrial academic complex, they, um, they collaborate for research into military and dual use systems. Dual use systems um, in this instance is defined as a research with non-military applications as well as military applications. Um, in the report, I point out that, well, you know, one example of uh, such research is, um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, picric acid or pistric acid, um, which was um, a material that was developed during World War I that could be used to treat burns as well as cause explosives. It's sort of a grim irony there, <laughs> but that, that, that's an example of a dual use research. And um, this, however, this report focuses particularly on the implications of uh, university involvement in two key technologies. Um, these are two technologies that basically the military perceives will be extremely important for future warfare you could say. And um, one of these technologies is called emerging disruptive technologies. It's often acronymized or often labeled as EDTs. And um, the definition of these technologies is basically that they will um, have a rev revolutionary impact on future warfare. Um, the military believes that they're extremely important to achieve dominance and victory in future warfare. And um, the most important of these technologies, the one that kind of leads the way, you might say, is um, artificial intelligence, which is um, which is a technology that um, uh, when in which computer systems basically perform functions that are ordinarily performed by human intelligence, you can say. And um, this technology, this these technologies, emerging disruptive technologies, are extremely important um, in the contemporary context. Uh, because they're being used, widely used, in um, two wars that are currently receiving uh, the most global attention. Uh, one of these wars is the war in Ukraine, and the other, uh, the war in Gaza. And I put um, a link in the chat that uh, basically shows how um, these technologies are being used in Ukraine, and particularly it's, an, it's um, a link from timemagazine.com, um, in which, uh, in the cover, they refer to um, the war in Ukraine as the quote, quote, first AI war, basically. So I think it offers a sort of useful um, insight into how these technologies are currently being used in warfare. 
Um, now, the second group of technologies, besides um, emerging disruptive technologies that uh, the military believes will be important for future warfare and that universities are working with the military and the, uh, and the arms industry with, um, our technologies are called militarized environmental technologies. And these are basically technologies, environmental technologies, you know, for military use uh, in order to um, basically uh, make the military overcome uh, difficulties and obstacles posed by climate change. So to give an example, um, you know, of what these kinds of technologies are, militarized environmental technologies, in the report, I mentioned at some point that the University of Salford is working with the University of Southampton to improve the, the, the efficiency of um, BAE systems or ships. Um, BAE systems, one of the largest arms companies in um, the large arms company in the UK, actually one of the largest in the world. And um, the, the, the basically the applications for this for the military, um, we, we, can de we can decipher what you know, military purpose this research will have if we look at um, the challenges that are currently being posed by climate change in the military. And in the case of this research, um, it, well, it's been shown, um, I think I put the link there in the chat as well from the Guardian, that it's been shown that um, rising sea temperatures in the Persian Gulf are basically um, undermining the efficiency of warships that are operating in the area. Because these, temp these water temperatures need to be cold in order to keep the engines from the warships from overheating. So what happens now is that due to climate change, um, the water temperatures are actually, you know, you know they're, they're not cold anymore. They're actually getting warmer. So they're not doing their job by cooling down those engines, which is reducing the efficiency of these warships. So um, Bay System Southampton did not make that explicit that, you know, it's being used for that purpose, but that seems to be very likely the applications of that research. Um, so those are the technologies. On the one hand, um, emerging disruptive technologies and militarized environmental technologies, two technologies that universities are working with the military and the arms industry on, and two technologies are extremely important for future warfare. Now this raises the question, where do universities come into this? And um, basically, why do universities need the military? Why do they need to work with the military, more broadly speaking? And why do the military need to work with the universities? Yeah, basically, the answer to these two questions can be answered in large parts by the concept of privatization. Uh, and um, privatization is a socioeconomic phenomenon. It basically refers to the government and the public sector um, doing less funding and less activities, and the private sector doing more funding and more activities. And um, so to explain how this process is basically driving the universities and the military towards each other, um, I'm, go I'm going to yeah, explain how that's happening, basically. Um, so um, in the case of universities, what privatization means is that the government is basically funding universities less and less you can say, and industry is funding universities more and more. And one of those industries is the arms industry. And another um, aspect to privatization, basically, is that um, universities are sort of being encouraged by the government to treat industry as, um, as a customer for academic services, you can say. So, and um, one concrete, ex a modern example of how this works is if you look at something called the Defense and Security Accelerator, which is basically a government-led initiative that tries to link universities with the arms industry so that universities can sort of develop solutions for whatever needs and concerns that the arms industry has. So that's that's an example of sort of um, how um, universities are sort of being encouraged to, you know, like um, allocate their resources towards addressing the needs of industry and industry are actually funding more and more um, services, uh, funding universities more and more. Now, to explain why the military, on the other hand, needs universities, now we need to talk about a different concept. We need to move away from, you know, um, who's funding universities and such. Um, to address why the military needs universities, um, one concept to look into here is research and development. And um, research and development is basically the central means by which 
knowledge is generated and also the means by which you try and derive applications for knowledge. And um, what privatization is basically meant uh, in the long term is that um, the government is doing less and less research and development and industry and universities are doing more and more research and development. So what this basically means is that all, you know, every, you think about all these, you know, fancy sort of scientific discoveries, scientific innovations, those are mostly happening in industry and universities, not, you know, not the government and not even less so military labs. So the military in the UK, if you look at several like national security documents, they often say that, you know, we need academic expertise, we need industry expertise because um, that's where all their research and development is basically happening. And um, a, 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 an associate development with um, basically industry universities doing more and more research and development is also that the civilian and commercial sector is sort of playing the leading role in spearheading like, you know, um, technological scientific discoveries, which also means that um, more and more military innovations and discoveries are basically um, based on appropriating technology from the civilian and commercial sector. So now a phenomenon that you're seeing in Ukraine and the link I showed and everything is that lo um, lots of companies who you don't think is part of the arms industry, you know, software companies maybe, um, are now providing goods for military use. So that's sort of linked to um, industry university doing more and more research and development. Um, now to go back to the two technologies, the main technologies in this report, em emerging disruptive technologies and militarized environmental technologies. Um, several you know, benefits have been linked to these technologies. Emerging disruptive technologies like AI have been sort of, um, you know, the, the military believes that they can reduce civilian harm during a war, actually make it likely the civilians get harmed and, um, and die as well. And whereas militarized environmental technologies, besides the obvious benefit of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, they can also improve military capabilities. So the military sees um, something in it for them as well. Um, I give the example in the report of how noise reduction reduces greenhouse gas emissions, but it also improves the surveillance capabilities of military aircraft and vehicles. Um, however, concerns have been raised about these technologies as well. Because I, I mentioned, for instance, that you know the military believes that um, artificial intelligence can reduce civilian casualties, and but Right now, um, I think what is currently going on in Gaza calls that greatly into question because an AI targeting platform is being used there and it's not um, performing as advertised, you can say. It's causing very, very high historic levels of uh, uh, civilian deaths. So it's very, very unlikely that it can actually deliver on that front. And also, um, the, thing, the thing about this, this idea that can reduce civilian deaths is that, um, it can reduce the, it basically reduces the way I say the political cost of going to war. So um, if you're a belligerent and you want to, you know, start a war, start a conflict, if a certain technology, if you believe that certain technology is not going to cause much harm to civilians and your own troops, you might be more inclined to actually start a war. That's already arguments that some um, experts have used. So in other words, the, the, the paradox there is that if it reduces civilian harm, it can also sort of, um, increase the inclination to go to war to begin, begin with. <laughs> so it's kind of a dilemma there, you can say. Um, so, okay, so those are examples of some concerns of these technologies. Now, I, I just gave, you know, examples of um, how these technologies can be dangerous, how they can be harmful. So let's just assume that, you know, um, some people believe that we should terminate production on these weapon systems, you know, given all these dangers. And universities should stop collaborating with, you know, the military and the arms industry on these technologies. Well, one problem arises if we, um, if you, if anyone reaches that conclusion, which is that there are many workers um, who are often dependent on you know the employment from those companies that basically manufacture these weapon systems, and there are many regions in the UK that are very strongly dependent on the arms industry. So, to give an example, um, the Typhoon jet, um, that's the one that's been used um, in uh, Yemen, for instance, to cause has caused grave environmental civilian harm, but that is manufactured in part of the UK that depends heavily um, on the arms industry for employment, basically. And the arms industry um, uh, very likely, you know, is very strategic about where it locates these facilities, basically, so that if you decide to say you don't want them anymore, 
you know, that we should terminate production. Well, now they can say, well, you know, no, because well, a bunch of people are going to be out of a job. And um, this factor is important because those are um, alludes to very significant concepts that I raised in the report, which is environmental social governance criteria, basically, which is um, something that's been used to sort of um, exclude. It's basically uh, refers to criteria that measures the environmental social impacts of a company as well as how accountable and transparent that company is. And um, arms companies basically say that we know, well, we are contributing to, you know, environmental standards by making militarized environmental technologies. But they also say that we're contributing to social standards by, you know, um, sort of getting young people interested in science and technology and, you know, giving people jobs in these communities. So uh, that's, However, I bring up in the report that this is kind of a cynical branding exercise <laughs> because of uh, it's just a way of sort of, um, you know, um, cleaning up your image, basically. So, um, and also the thing about um, the, the universities that um, when it comes to social criteria, which is like, you know, we're providing jobs, we're getting young people interested in science and technology, universities play a very strong role in that because they actually deepen the impact uh, or at least the presence of these arms companies in these universities when they work with um, these universities, you know, when they help them to get young people interested in science and technology and military. Like what they're doing basically is to um, increase, uh, you might say the scope of these companies over these communities, you know, to make it hypothetically even more difficult, you know, to basically reverse and terminate weapons production. Um, so I think on that note, um, that's what drives me to sort of the recommendations I make in the report and the solutions in the forms of disarmament and conversion. Because I basically, I mentioned in the report that, you know, the fundamental problem here is the military industrial complex and uh, these weapon systems basically provide a means for the military industrial complex to gain control over universities and these individual communities. And um, by pursuing disarmament, which is um, not only reducing the military budget, but basically making, um, supporting holistic international agreements on arms reduction you can reduce the control of the military industrial complex over all these resources. However, it also needs to be complemented with economic conversion, which is a process where you basically take, you know, whether it's universities or factories or dependents on military funding, and you try and um, basically develop, you know, non-military um, uses and, um, and functions for those um, laboratories and communities. So um, I basically, I, I provide examples of how universities have supported those two things and also how universities can support those two things in the future. So I think on that note, that's the broad, I think that's a broad overview of it. And uh, I'll just uh, leave it to the panelists. Yeah. Thank you very much, Akopi. Yes, and uh, um, hopefully in the Q&A, um, we can maybe delve more into one or two of the examples that um, from your report. Um, on that note, anyone who does have questions, post them in the Q&A at any time. They'll be answered after all our panelists have spoken, but you know, whenever a question occurs to you, do yeah. feel free to post it. So um, I will hand over now to Andy to um, give his, I don't know if you've had time to read uh, uh, the, the report or some of the report, but... Um, it's, 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 give your thoughts on the yeah. issue and the report. Yeah, okay. no, it, it's really, thank you. really I, thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, Akobi, thank you for that great talk. I, 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 have, I haven't read it properly because it's really rich, but I have looked at it and seen quite how much material is there. So I really will be sure to, to, to be using it. Um, as um, was mentioned at the beginning, I'm, uh, I, my work, my day job is looking at the politics of science and technology in quite a general sense. And in particular, looking at the kinds of forces that shape the directions for research and innovation throughout in the world. And we, we tend, I just want to back up a bit from, from in order to emphasize the importance of what you put over so well, Akopi, um, the, the, the bigger picture was that we live in societies that don't tend to talk about the direction for science and technology. It's just about discovering stuff. You've got to be, if you're not pro-technology or anti-technology in some general sense. And this is a really uh, quite delusional language across the board, um, not just in this area, because we're living in a world where technologies we use in everyday life, in food, in farming, in housing, in energy, in chemicals, 
are all driven in directions that yield intellectual property, private profit, um, market control over markets and supply chains, national advantage. These are the motivations that shape technologies across all those sectors, rather than uh, open source, grassroots innovation, uh, or environmental challenges, which would yield different kinds of technologies across the board. So that's my starting point, that it's not just about whether we go forward or back with technologies, it's about the kinds of technologies we have. But all those forces I mentioned, none of them are as powerful uh, as the driving force from the military. Um, and not only that, but the kind of disciplines, whether it be historians, social scientists, science and technology studies, all kinds of different disciplines look in on the kinds of issues about what kinds of technologies we're getting across different sectors. But there's an amazing neglect for the military, even by critics. Um, so on the one hand, you've got the biggest problem because around the world, according to the OECD, 50% of global public expenditure on research and innovation generally is on military applications. So the favorite thing for government in relation to science and technology is to support projection of mass violence. That's the favorite, more than health, more than environmental sustainability, more than climate, much, much more. So when you've got the scale of the imprinting of, of those kinds of motives, then the fact that also the academic community, the critical community, NGOs, big NGOs that used to work on disarmament, uh, you know, huge credit to Sam and colleagues and Okopi and your organization that you're exceptions to this. But by and large, we've seen a complete attenuation, not just in studies in universities, but in civil society, critiquing this kind of thing. So that's why I'm I'm hugely welcoming and appreciative of this work. And the implications then go beyond uh, even what's been said, because the technologies we're getting are imprinted. Uh, one of the, the technical words that I find quite useful, imprinted, their shape, the forms they take is imprinted by these military spin-offs. So for instance, a, a classic example that I'm working on with my colleague Phil Johnston at Sussex is the degree to which the energy policies of the major powers of the world is completely warped towards nuclear power, civil nuclear power, by the military aims. Everyone knows that there are re relationships in terms of materials, but they sort of diminished with the so-called peace dividend and the plutonium that's available. But cutting a long story short, the ability to build, as BAE Systems does in the UK, nuclear propelled submarines is staggeringly hard. And you can only do that in an economy that's got that's channeling vast flows of resource from electricity consumers across to the military industrial base to keep this industry in operation so that when submarines are needed, they can be built without having to pay for the entire nuclear fabrication industry. And as a result, then it's not just we have uh, which <laughs> the submarines themselves and their various applications. What we have is an energy system that's massively more expensive and that delivers climate goals other targets much more slowly, much less effectively than would otherwise be the case. But we're not talking about this because we don't, we believe the rhetoric that nuclear is a zero carbon option and that that's the government's rationale. When in fact, you can see in France, in the USA, certainly in Russia and China, that is not the rationale behind nuclear at all. And the same thing is true in other sectors that public health is warped um, by uh, a focus on gene editing, on uh, mass distributed pharmaceuticals and vaccines for all the benefits these things can have in particular applications. We're looking at those far more than public health measures, clean water, good housing, which we know are more effective in health terms because the military need these technologies in order to project force, they need it to treat armies and so on. Um, it's very well documented, but little discussed in wider debate. So what happen is happening in universities then is the tip of an iceberg of this bigger picture. But perhaps it's an Achilles heel, and that's where I wanted to just end what I say and why I think this work is so important that Okopi has done here. Because with um, this uh, with this sort of importance comes a lot of interference. And the signs of that, for instance, in the UK, it's a bit a uh, micro point, but 2022, then Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng 
for the first time ever in British history, intervened in the appointment of the head of the Economic and Social Research Council. And he did so to block an appointment of an economist from Oxford in order to get his own candidate in. Now, why would a government minister want to control the directions for social research? It's because for the first time now, I think, universities are finding themselves on the front line in these struggles. They are, it's, it's just like as mining, you know, was a front line in an earlier time and other industries have been. Surprisingly, universities now are on front line because of the challenge that they can present to this kind of pattern of imprinting of the directions for science and technology in the ways I've just been mentioning. Um, and we've experienced that at Sussex. We do work on military nuclear applications and boy, do we get backlash. And that comes down the system very strongly. Uh, the university is just not equipped to resist this kind of thing. But even more important than that in universities, I think, and I could colleagues here can correct me if I'm uh, wrong in this, but is they students coming through universities are a source of enormous worry to government. Uh, we see with this so-called STEM agenda that Okopi mentioned, the uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but the government is hell-bent on promoting that. It's bullying universities, it's disciplining degree programs, incentivizing students, a lot of money, a lot of effort is being spent helping to try and cajole students into, work, into um, going into the, the kinds of subjects that then feed the military industrial complex, um, as well as other industry. But in the UK, that's disproportionately military industrial complex. And this is despite the fact that actually no one disagrees with the creative arts, for instance, being far more important to the British economy than the military industrial complex. So it's not an economically driven. You can make a, as Akopi ended in his talk, you can make a stronger economic case for encouraging work outside STEM in particular areas. And yet that's not the case because we're driven by the sentiment, I think, of a post-colonial country wanting its seat at the top table, as the British elite like to say. And so therefore it pushes students. And, and that worry we've noticed in the nuclear area is really on the top of the agenda that students are voting with their feet, engineers going to renewables rather than to aerospace, and then in general, students in general go into humanities, arts, rather than engineering and, and the sciences. Um, and without denigrating those subjects, that students cannot be allowed then to vote with their feet in this way. And universities are the site of this struggle. And it's beginning really quite um, heated. So that's, um, that's it really. This is what Foucault called biopower, the power of how people live their lives. And it's not just then research and the activities of research, it's also students and what they choose to do and what universities enable students to do. And that's why I really welcome hearing from other colleagues here who are right on the front lines of some of those struggles. So uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity to join in this discussion. And thanks hugely for this uh, wonderful resource uh, for people working in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Really fascinating to hear about that, just the extent to which military priorities drive research and the academic agenda and what you said about students sort of voting with their feet didn't I think um Akopi's uh organization uh dedication just uh I don't know if you they did the poll or just published the poll um so finding that two-thirds of STEM students would prefer to go into military civil sorry civil rather than military technology given the choice that yeah it's, it doesn't seem to be a popular choice. So um, with that, I'll um, pass on to uh, Victoria, um, who I, I think you're going to talk about um, both from your perspective as uh, in, involved in Palestine activism, as as well as as um, a peace studies scholar. So um, Victoria, over to you. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, right, can, is that okay? Yeah, good. Um, right, so first of all, uh, I will say that currently I'm actually not in a peace studies department. Uh, that's largely because they've been slashed. <laughs> as part of this um a part of this whole campaign to basically turn our universities into war machines 
Um, and I will sort of draw a bit upon that, but I can no longer um, hold claim to a peace studies label as unfortunately rest in, 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 in peace studies. Um, so I, first of all, would like to congratulate campaign against the arms trade and demilitarize education for this extremely important report. And as a Palestinian woman, this couldn't be more important to me as we see both an edgicide and a genocide take place in Gaza. And this is interesting as universities are some of the most complicit institutions in the world in this genocide, but also universities in Gaza have been the biggest victim, essentially, and part of the, the education system as well, the biggest victim. And I think that it within that framework, and I will talk a lot about Gaza, but I will like to say that this, that, that the war machine that is our universities that le leaves no stone unturned. Un unturned. There is there is no there is no people in the world or or nation or group or marginalized community that have not suffered from this the violence of our universities. And yes, we need to indeed understand this report as a call to action um, and to stand up for a world of social justice and peace. Of course, as, we, as it says in the report, the pursuit of military dominance is driven by the desire to preserve the capacity of the UK to launch global military actions and these have devastating humanitarian um, consequences. And through this, the military industrial academic complex contributes to the normalization of war and military power through not only research partnerships, but its investments and the way it ties into the carceral state in this country and provides the technology of authoritarianism and war abroad. Of course, we know it's a profitable cycle where war begets more war, with the UK directly implicit in selling arms uh, to some of the most violent regimes on the planet. And this isn't by this 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 isn't a, a surprise because this is essentially a neoliberal economic system. But also it goes back and, and uh, before this, and I think um the report sort of focuses on uh the last century, but we um sorry, this is just an image of the University of Gaza. Um, that's recently been destroyed. Um, uh, yeah, but I think it's important to understand as well the report and in and the intrinsic link between military between militarism and racism and racial capitalism. Um, and it's not difficult to see how places such as Palestine and other communities, including communities in the UK, bear the brunt of the state violence, um, which is driven by the military industrial academic complex. Um, we do know that the Palestinian struggle resists against capital capitalism, capitalist exploitation and colonial subjugation. And some of the Palestinian universities have been the foremost producers of these 
philosophies and pedagogies of hope, of resistance, of peace. So it's no coincidence, really, that an edgicide is taking place in Gaza, where all seven universities have been destroyed and the entire university system destroyed. Edgicide um, was first used in the context of the Iraq war to, in 2003 to talk about the full set sail uh, destruction of systems, including the education system. I do, and I do say this often that it, perhaps if there had been more accountability of universities when it came to the Iraq war, that we might not be in a, in, in a situation now where we have universities fully complicit in the complete edgicide of an entire nation. And of course, we know that the same technology is used to suppress dissent on campuses, turning them into authoritarian war machines. And this does run deep and it continues. Um, and it ran deep throughout the colonial era. Um, and it's important to understand that th this violence doesn't, this violence from universities doesn't start in that, the sort of 1920s or in World War One, but the history of uh, universities' it, complicity in this in in violence, it goes right through the uh, history of colon of 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 colonization. And actually, universities were first sort of used as a way to both um, support the slave trade and genocide and research of the past that both policed and dehumanized people of color. Um, and I don't think we can subtract from, 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 from those allegations. And we have seen actually through, for example, before this, uh, the genocide in Gaza, we have seen students also come to uh, try to take universities uh, to account for their role in, in this his history of violence. So in terms of my own university, I was recently shocked to find out that the University of Lincoln are in a consortium with Elbit Systems, Capita and Raytheon. And you might know this, but Elbit Systems provide 80% of the technology of genocide for the IDF in Gaza. Um, and when we look at our localities, we can see the especially around universities, and this is, is something that Akopi talks about, which, for example, in, in, in the University of Lancaster and Cumbria, where this actually your sense of, of place and the way that universities are building buildings and embedding into their communities is within, very much within this, within buildings, within the space of the military industrial complex. And I pretty much live on campus and within about three miles radius of my home, there's Leonardo, there's Prime Take, there's Teledyne, and also there's lots of uh, <laughs> militarist symbols, like that we've even got a, a statue of a tank um, <laughs> down the road. And we see we see this actually a lot in, in areas such as these Midlands where they talk about the levelling up agenda. Well, what does that mean? It basically means the growth of the military, industrial, academic complex. And what we need to do and, and how this 
uh, report is is a call to action is that we need to uh, sever completely sever the military industrial academic complex from our communities from our pensions we need to shame them and we need to push them out and as workers and as students we need to be very clear that we do not want jobs or ed education at the cost of genocide and it's not just a legal imperative uh, sorry it's not just a moral imperative it's also a legal one we have seen that recently through the ICJ that Israel has been told that it has a duty to abide by the Genocide Convention. Well, not it, just Israel. That message was to third parties as well, and third parties include our universities. So that was a call for universities to immediately divest and sever any partnerships that could be complicit in the um, the genocide in Gaza. And as we can see by a copy's uh, report that these, the, these links and this complicity runs deep. So what do, what do we um, want to do? Well, first of all, it, we have seen actions on campus, but um, and and they are important and they have been been mapped but it's not enough we need to up the game we need to unite we need to see more workplace days of action we need to see more walkouts and we need to see more pressure on our universities to sever these links and i think it's important through that that we also come together. Um, for example, tomorrow, uh, I've got a plug here. There is a protest um, in front of USS London. And the report does note USS is, is uh, the company which manages some of the pensions for university workers who have who who did say in 2016 that they were going to uh, have more more of an ethical policy but then are refusing to divest from uh from Israel's compl complicity in in Gaza so tomorrow there is a protest um and you can find more information about that on the university and college workers but for Gaza, uh, sorry, for Palestine social media. So please do look on. So I, I, I just wanted to, to end by uh, talking a little bit about also where we go from here. Well, we see that part of the reason I, I feel that Palestinian universities and Palestinian scholars have been targeted in the edgy side in Gaza is because they represent a a different pedagogy of this of the war than the war machine they offer an education of peace of hope of love and i think that what we need to do is try to as 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 workers and as students we need to come together and try to fight back both within and outside our universities to build those relationships based on on that pedagogy of peace and, and hope and we do that by not only confronting the war machine but also by building our own spaces spaces like this spaces outside the classroom or occupations or protests these are are the new universities the universities are the space university really is a space where 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 protest and education takes place and if we are to confront this we can only do do it that that way and that is how we can build our collective power and our collective solidarity to try and tear this horrific system down uh, i just wanted to end 
um, on a poem by an, uh, Dr. Rafat al arir who was recently murdered by the Israeli state with the complicity of British universities it, embedded in the military and in, industrial academic complex. He says, if I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and make some strings. Make it white with a long tail so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there, bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope, let it be a tale. And the tale is that this report is a call to action. Thank you very much, Victoria. And yeah, really important to, to connect what's happening in universities that the um, report exposes to its impact, to it, uh, the, the impact of imperial violence around the world, which it's, is seen most horrifically uh, in the genocide in Gaza at the moment. And the importance of the, these contrasting possible roles for universities as places of pedagogy between pedagogies of domination and those of um, peace and hope. Um, so with that, I'll pass on to River, and I think they're going to be talking about uh, re resistance uh, on on campuses and elsewhere to the, these um, to these tendencies. Okay, uh, off you go, River. Ooh, hello. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'd just like to follow up the kind of last talk with like um, the kind of understanding of university staff who make these decisions as well because it's not just the institutions that are like allowing this to happen it is members of senior university management who are complicit in these things and they are the people who we also need to be like targeting because they are just as complicit as the university as a whole they are making these decisions and allowing this to happen um and i think because i'm a su officer um at the university of nottingham there have been times where I've been in rooms with these people and uh, I think kind of explaining how they understand the situation really gives like a overview of why the situation has continued to happen. Um, like university staff, senior university staff genuinely think that they're doing really good work to help the world and they kind of turn a blind eye to all these things that are happening and kind of like just shield off their vision and pretend that it's it's not something they can do anything about and kind of just give excuses. Um, like at my university, um, you know, we have values and it's to be a university without borders, to embrace opportunities by a changing world where ambitious people for creative culture will enable us to change the world for, for the better. Um, and yet my university works with BA Systems, Rolls-Royce, invites like 20 companies to, art, to careers fairs, to recruit students to the arms trade. Um, and they know they're doing this. It's this. These problems aren't something that has just been, you know, in the last year, these things have been going on for decades, and they they know they're part of this. They just choose not to act on it. Um, and I think as a response to all the actions and stuff going on, you know, even in good faith, if universities said, you know, we're looking to the future and we're going to phase out military partnerships in the future, they could do things like um, opening up what actual research is being done and how that research is being used. But even that is a push for them. They don't want people to realize what is actually going on in universities and they go out of their way deliberately to hide this, especially from students. Um, the more people who are aware of these issues, the more action and mass participation would actually happen. Um, but, and when, and when the university as well says, you know, we want students to participate, we want students to be like active members of communities, we want students to learn. But then at the same time, they hide these links. Um, and we can understand that universities don't actually want students to know this knowledge and have like critical independence of like understanding and shaping how their universities are. University manage managers just want the university to be in their in their in, in their image, um, and they always say, you know, it's profit margins, it's pressures from above. Um, you know, they have to meet amount of uh, companies invited to careers fairs, and no one seems to be making the first move. 
but part of this research and why it's so important, it explains how we can actually move towards a sustainable future where universities aren't being used for military purposes. Um, and it's kind of an ignorance, really, from a lot of these senior managers who just, you know, they don't want to commit to giving the time because they know if they just stay where they are and keep on accepting these research projects for tens of millions of pounds, you know, they can get one up on another university and, you know, they can they can feel better about themselves because their university has gone up one one rank in the league tables, you know. And um, I think it's it's really worth emphasising that our universities can change and a lot of action is happening. But it's also about, you know, making these people aware that they are actually doing bad things. And the research that comes out, especially this research piece, like we need active things that we can give to universities and be like, this is how you're actually impacting people. Because a lot of them don't believe, they genuinely don't believe that their universe, like the university research is causing harm. Like a lot of the time they try and greenwash it, you know, they work at BAE and they go, well, you know, we're making BAE more sustainable and that's a good thing. And they genuinely don't believe that they have their, 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 there's consequences for their, for their decisions, you know? And I think like universities, we're complicit in imperialism, right? Like it's British bombs, British aerospace, British, British missiles and British weaponry, which is being used across the world, like implemented by places, places like BAE and Rolls-Royce um, and are being used to, to do things like illegal, illegal military occupations and just create an awful situation for other people across the world. And I think it's really worth targeting universities on their stances because universities try and you know they could i don't know what the word is for it but they try and like greenwash but for activism or like social issues you know they kind of they say that they're doing good things and convince communities especially when they're gentrifying and increasing their campuses and you know saying they're giving people jobs they say you know the university is doing things to help everyone you know the university is a good place for everyone and we're making the world a better place but we need to start unraveling this and making people realize that the universities are actually creating a dangerous situation in the UK, especially when students want to do degrees and want to, you know, live their lives doing something they feel important. And then they're told that, you know, if you want to do a PhD and you're an engineering student, you've got to join an arms company. You're funneled into these systems. And I think when we understand universities, we have to be very critical of the way that they're actually acting in reality because they they get away with pretending that they're, you know, saving the world. And in reality, we need we need students, we need staff, and we need communities to know what is actually going on in the background. And this leads on to student action. Um, students are becoming more aware, especially with the recent continuation of war crimes by Israel, of how universities are actually complicit in the system. Um, in 2022 and 2023, there was about seven or eight universities who took out occupations or protests on campus. And this year that has only grown with like most universities in the UK, students are coming out on the streets in universities and pressuring universities. And in places like Glasgow, where occupations happened recently, the university has agreed to come to the table and actually meet around these things. Um, maybe they'll actually listen, who knows? But it seems like they're pretty content in, you know, just trying to pile students. Um, but, you know, there's been historic wins of demilitarized activism, especially from students. Um, getting ethical investments, um, uh, pensions, divestments in some places, student union motions, um, at Nottingham, um, we've stopped companies from like BAE Systems and Rolls Royce from appearing at careers fairs and also blockaded like the Royal Air Force when they come to do recruitment sessions on campus. Um, but it, again, I think a lot of it is just raising awareness because when students are left in the dark, um, when students don't know how the universities actually operate, um, the it's, it's how the universities get away with it, right? It's what they want. They don't want students to be aware of this. And they continue to to press this image as if they as if they really care about students. But honestly, they care about the profit margins. Um, and what students want isn't what they want. And it kind of under, it's understanding the relationship between students and universities and how our experience as education is directly impacted by people who are at the top, who have links to the military, who decide to take this path. And it's not a path that students want, you know. The research came out recently says that a lot of students in STEM don't want to work for the arms trade. It's just the only path that you're given. 
if you're doing engineering, one of the only paths. And because the universities decide that they don't want to actually initiate green policies, you know, they'll greenwash for the life of it. But in terms of actually doing anything about it, they will just ship you off to work at an arms company. Um, so I think, you know, we have to highlight this issue to as many people as can, because then more action happens. Um, and I think it reaches a point as well. There's a chance. It's like, if we don't get it, we shut it down. Universities, if they continue to be complicit in genocide, we need to shut them down. Like, we are the people who inhabit universities. We are the people who work there. We are the people who study there. We have the communities in our universities. And it's a decision by a few people at the top deciding how they want to shape universities. And it is a time of resistance and a time that we can actually come together around something that builds peace for the future. Um, and I think as well, it's highlighting that, you know, this militarization isn't just something that's happening globally, like, you know, the, the securitization of borders and all this stuff, which is being implemented by universities, but it's also something that happens on our own campuses. You know, students who actually want their university to be a place that they want to attend and want to feel like part of that community and feel like it's something they can own, you know, they are often met with securitization, repression, uh, physical assaults by security staff, private investigations by tens of thousands of pounds, suspensions, expulsions. You know, universities don't want to engage with this. You can meet individual staff members who, you know, really care about this stuff. A lot of a lot of staff on universities really care and really want to change this. But the people at the top, they do not believe that their actions have consequences. They genuinely believe that they're in a bubble of like a um, a group thing where everyone would just agree with them because they're at the top of the system and shield themselves off from as many students and staff as possible. And I think that's really why like the student actions recently is really building that capacity to have a longer term effect and really force universities to accept the role they're playing and be held accountable in the work that they're actually producing. Um, and more cynically than that as well, a lot, a lot of the paper talks about greenwashing from universities, which I think is something that we need to focus on a lot more as well, because it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the idea of sustainability. Um, you know, they, they understand that a way to get students involved in coming to university and to give them that money is to shape around the idea around the notion of sustainability. But at universities, this is done with arms companies. You know, you can't make like warfare green and clean, you know, it's not it's not a thing that exists. And it's the idea of like trusting these arms companies with the direction of our universities. It's like thinking that our arms trade, arms dealers and the arms trade has universities best interests in how our lives are shaped. And it's obviously not true because you see where these weapons end up and you see what happens with them. And yet universities continue to think, you know, it's a social good, you know, it's helping people, it's developing jobs. But you then submit yourself to be at the will of the arms trade and arms dealers who obviously are just doing it for profit, you know? And it's the thing of unveiling, this research is so important because it unveils these relationships with the university and the and the arms trade. Um, and I think the more we highlight the direct link between universities and the arms trade, you know, it's not just it's not just research. These things are actually being used in active conflicts and active war zones. We need to raise awareness to not just people in our community, but also people outside the community as well. You know, it's like there's a hub in my campus which is used for advanced manufacturing, which has been used um, for planes that have been used in either. Yemen or Palestine and people in our communities are upset and they're protesting in towns and protesting in the city and yet it's the idea that we don't know what the real things that are happening in our universities and people feel like you know how could a university really be implementing research which is used in conflict zones and I think it's revealing revealing that that kind of knowledge to people because universities the thing they do the best is dismiss everything you know, when there's been occupations on campus, the response by universities is to be like, actually, no, this is re this research is really good for the economy. It's really good for sustainability. These students are just weird and, you know, they've got an axe to grind. But telling this stuff to our communities that the university is actively complicit and actively helping genocide is something that's so important to do. 
And I think this research is something that we can take to universities and build upon. And I think, especially using stuff like education as well and a database, we can actively see how much money the, our universities are taking from the arms trade. Um, and yeah, I think just to finish on that, we can we can change our universities. Our universities can be better, and ultimately, they're the places that we inhabit. They're, you know, there are universities. They're not senior management universities, and I think we can change the face of universities to be something that does do actual good for the world. You know, their statements about creating a better world. It can be done. It's just we need to be the people to initiate that because it's not going to come from them. Um, so yeah, I hope that wasn't too rambly, but thank you. Not rambly at all. Thank you very much, Viva, for ending us on a positive note, um, highlighting both the the complicity, the responsibility of university managements, but also the the, the ways that they are um, susceptible to pressure from the university communities they're supposed to represent, and the the, the victories that can be won when when people do take action. Um, so. Uh, there's loads of questions um, in the uh, in the Q and A. Excellent um, questions. I'm first going to um, ask uh, one of my own, um, uh, particularly uh, to, to Akopi. But um, if anyone uh, else wants to chime in with um, brief good examples, um, there were three uh, you, universities that you highlighted as as key case studies. Um, Lancaster, um, Southampton, and University College, and uh, sorry, Imperial College, London, um, and various specific projects, arms company collaborations. Um, can you talk just a little bit about, is there one example of a university arms industry collaboration that, that really struck you as particularly um, st striking, revealing, uh, problematic? And and why? Yes, I probably should have made that more clear initially. Yeah, the report included these um, these uh, case studies on three universities, and I was very deliberate in the order. I even choose them in the report because I wanted to show how, like, if we showed our problems with all these technologies, they have you know communities like Lancashire to worry about. <laughs> so yeah, but um, uh, yeah, no, I, I think there are quite a number of um very problematic examples, ones you would not expect. But I think the one that really leapt out at me was um, the Aladdin project in Southampton University. And that was a project um, with, um, it wasn't just Southampton, it was several researchers from several UK universities. And it was a project um, that employed auton autonomous systems, which is one, one emerging disruptive technology. Um, it applied, applied that technology to disaster management. and. Something that happened with this project, BAE Systems was involved, and they said that they're going to use this technology from the project and basically apply it to um, cooperative control of drones, <laughs> so and military drones specifically. So it was like um, something that was a, a project that you know on the surface of it has a type of humanitarian impact. Now BAE Systems is you know sort of deriving a um, application from it that could have a you know disastrous impact so i found i found that quite striking and um uh i think another um other examples um came from relatively uh i think uh i didn't go with me too much detail into it but in imperial college london i talked about how the, uh, the university is working with several um offices from the u.s department of defense and i think those examples i point out are the most sort of explicit military research projects i found in the report so they're working on, so for instance, these tiny drones that look like little birds. <laughs> That's one project that a professor at university is working with. And another, another professor is working on a project that um, has applications to directed energy weapons, I think. And uh, that's, which is another emerging disruptive technology. So those are some of the most explicit military examples. But I think Aladdin is one project that kind of um, from South African University stuck with me. <laughs> I, was, I was kind of startled by, um, how that went, yeah. And I also raised the point that um, for the campaign to stop killer robots, um, because they covered a similar project. I, I sort of used that as an example to show how um, the project that's covered by campaign to stop killer robots, like we should maybe um, 
I, I say be be on their guard <laughs> given the example of the lab. So yeah. Yes. Um thanks. Yeah, no, that, that one um it, it was really quite shocking. And uh Aladdin, by the way, stands for autonomous learning agents for decentralized data and information networks. Um so on to the questions uh in in the Q and A. Um so uh okay, this this uh Perhaps this is a good one for R River and um, Victoria, but but for anyone who wants to chime in on it, um, uh, I recently this is from Penny Dean. I recently took part in challenging a BAE systems recruitment event at my university, just politely asking questions in the webinar about BAE systems business, and the Uni Careers Service issued warnings about the need to follow the university's code of conduct and be kind and respectful. Respectful. I uh, would love to hear your thoughts on the weaponization of code and of conduct and disciplinary procedures to suppress dissent. And how do we challenge this rhetoric as the HE sector collectively? So if um, anyone wants to... to, to uh, have a go at answering that. Uh, go, go ahead. Uh, River, do you want to say um, I can say a little bit. Um, I guess at some point in university, there will be decisions that they might, are making, which is actively harming people. Um, for me, it's a point of, I, I think universities, when they're doing something wrong, they're kind of, deliberation around like the code of conduct and like being like nice and presentable and all that stuff is really important in certain situations but I think at the same time we do need to make people aware especially in the BA systems like business chat we do need to make people aware in those in those groups that what they are doing is actively killing people ultimately and I think the idea of like you know being like respectful and kind is something that can be doing certain done in certain certain situations as well but I think like Ultimately, at some point, we also have to understand the ways we can engage with these conversations. And it's not to say, you know, we should be going around shouting at people and, you know, saying they're the most awful person. But I think sometimes, like, they need to be aware of what they're doing and they need to feel bad about it. Um, you can do that in different ways. But I think sometimes, you know, being respectful to people who are actively, like, taking money and working for the arms trade. Um, without even engaging with you, especially. I think a lot of the time it's easier to kind of go into that original kind of respectful stuff, but sometimes it does reach a point where they are just ignoring you and you do kind of need to raise your voice. Um, that might be a little bit too anarchisty or, you know, yeah. angry or something. But I think at some yeah. points, like, we do need to hold them accountable and that does include raising our voices and using the means we actually have. Because if we're polite and respectful, mm. a lot of the time they can just ignore us. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and uh, v Victoria or Andy or um, or a couple, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, Andy, you've got your I hand up. I, I, you know, it's a very delicate issue. River is right in how they handled it, but um, I I also want to. It's why I broaden things out a bit. This is not just restricted to as big as these issues are. This use of bullying to defend bu anti-bullying to defend bullying, uh, kindness to defend unkindness. It's across the board. It's absolutely endemic, and not just universities. This is how power works. And the best way to challenge it, I think, there's not one way, and there's, as you say, we have many different contexts. But actually, um, I don't know if a footballing analogy comes into mind, but there's a phrase, play the ball, not the player. And I think, for me, and it's personal, but the problem is power. And the, these people are being manipulated by it. And I think there's a way in which one can, alongside the strategy we just heard about, one can also just, we can share, look, we all regret how power's working here. Power is turning us into liars. It's making us say one thing, do another, Never mind on the military alone. And one can also find ways to actually make some of these characters allies against power, not maybe sometimes inadvertent. They'll admit things, uh, especially when they're coming near retirement. So there are ways of harnessing it as well. So it's like there's a whole... We can't afford to be too choosy in our strategies, and sometimes we're forced on the ground. But there's also ways in which we take on power directly. The 
what we're up against here is incumbent entrenched power and privilege and everyone to varying degrees are being victimized by this albeit with mm. greater or lesser levels of, 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 of uh, benefit from it mm. very much so uh, and anyone else want to chip in on on this question victoria uh, yeah if it's okay i'll just say a couple of words um so i think this is why as well it's important and and i sort of tried to say this when i spoke before to um frame these discussions in terms not only of of militarism but what that means in terms of colonial coloniality and racism and mm. also um any kind of any different marginalized communities because essentially what what these universities are trying to produce is not only authoritarianism but also these ideas of code of, of conduct etc are all uh, rooted in, in 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 white supremacy and are rooted in in class and elitism and the idea that somehow you're either producing <laughs> ro robots or you're producing a, a mirror image of, of essentially what the uh sort of the the, the people who 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 uh used to run the british empire would be like so in the palestinian context it's the suited and booted people of say the palestinian authority so it's mm. you have to sort of understand it in terms of policing communities mm. policing voices policing um power but it's who is in who is in power and that ruling that ruling the ruling class you can't you can't uh, sort of dislodge that from yeah. understanding universities and also the role that universities have not only in 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 policing essentially um the, the academic freedoms but also in terms of their relationship to the home office the relationship to the police so mm. what you essentially have is these institutions which are pretty much just another arm of, of the Home Office or MOD, uh, gaslighting students, mm. uh, students who are rational and who can understand power or who are, fr or who are um, sort of from abroad mm. who might have a different, ide different ideas are then uh, dehumanised, gaslit, um told i mean i get told i'm mad all the time it's it's like i'm like a running joke on campus because you question these things when essentially it's the university's code of conduct which needs to be indicted it's the university's conduct which needs to be indicted not oh, thank the you. students and staff absolutely Thank you very much, Victoria. Yeah, it's um, all really interesting. I want to move on to one or two other questions while we've, um, if we've still got a little time. Um, so this one from uh, Sumayo. Thanks to Akopi for his important report. I wonder if there is any research on how the participants in military research in universities feel about their involvement. Are they conflicted, proud or forced into it? I also wonder what research there is on how the wider public feel about such use of universities. So open to anyone who wants to, to give that one a go. Um, I, I think that there has been research, um, I believe by um, scientists of global responsibility, I mentioned earlier, um, at least regarding how um, professors at universities they're receiving military funding feel about that funding. But I'm not sure I've seen research about um, anyone who's actually involved in those projects. I think, um, uh, I, I mean, naturally there has been far more studies about um, the workers who are involved in, um, you know, manufacturing weapons, but I'm, I don't quite recall the, um, 
ones about the professors who are involved. Uh, then again, I think there there was some studies perhaps in the I, a very long time ago, maybe from the U.S. I think in the seventies about um, I think some researchers in um, maybe like um, some departments based, but it was based on like interview like quotes, basically saying like you know, um, well I don't I'm not sure I want to do this, but you know um, it, it is a good you know supply of money and funds. So <laughs> that's some sort of, sort of anecdotal data there, but yeah. Yeah, so. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, and Andy, you put your hand yeah, up. Just, just quickly, I think it, I I don't know about this, but actually, as as Akopi just said, the fact of it being so underdocumented is a really important area for work of the of the kind that Akopi, I know you're doing anyway on other fronts, as as Sam mentioned. But illuminating things, drawing attention to them, is such a powerful way. So producing st statistics, producing evidence on these attitudes might be a real priority for just doing the kind of things that, uh, that River and Victoria talked about. Anyone else want to chime in on this one? I'll just say as well, I think the kind of understanding of how they feel. Um, I think one thing that universities can be doing is starting this like just transition from working for the military into green jobs. And I think that's the kind of research that needs to be started in universities. And ultimately, like, people will probably feel better working for green companies if they have sustainable jobs that employs them with similar wages and makes them feel like they have a career and a future. But I think part of the problem is it's this, because of universities failing to take part in this, um, there's a lack of people to move into different opportunities. So people feel kind of stuck in these places and feel under attack when people are like, stop working at arms factories because what's the alternative? And that's that's a political mm. choice by our government and also by our universities for failing to undertake this research. Mm. Mm. Yep, uh, indeed. Thank you, River. Um, which really nicely leads us on to another question from Ian Hewitt. And uh, you, you've um, River's been sort of partly addressing this question already. Um, great and important event that shines some light in the darkness of the MIAC. Has any thought been given to links to the climate justice movement, and in particular of extending the notion of just transition to include the move away from militarism to peace? Um, and Ian is um, from the new Lucas plan, which I think works on just that. So, uh, yeah, uh, who, who wants to, to have a go at that one? Kopi and Andy. Sorry, I'll just uh, make a quick. Um, no, that's a great question because um, the Lucas Plan is covered in the report, um, the original Lucas Plan. I I, I have a quite a, a long section from them, a long section from them towards the end of the report as an example of an alternative to uh, military research in universities. And I, I make the connection um, at some point that um, yes, you can basically um, make the case for economic conversion. By basically saying that it will address the environment, it will address the energy problem, it will address the economic problem, and it also address the war problem. So it addresses all these problems simultaneously, and that's an example we might say is like connecting the dots. So, um, mm -hmm. so that um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, don't just sort of do um, the environment and peace separately. In fact, that's kind of the, the point I make in the report that um, about these military weapons. I, I mentioned the uh, case study on um, Imperial College London. That well, the military starts emitting fewer emissions. You know these green technologies. Well, okay, the military is emitting fewer um, emissions, but it can actually use that to enhance their military capabilities. <laughs> so it's like you get um, you get sort of positive environmental benefits, but with the cost of more war. So hence, hence why you use the term like green war. <laughs> yeah, so it's just like uh, yeah, <laughs> something to be cognizant which, about. So yeah, which itself has very negative consequences indeed. Yeah. So uh, 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 Andy, uh, yeah, and I think I, I, River, did you have your hand up as well? No, that was a, a gesture of approval, right? Uh, Andy. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that and very much agree with it. And and uh, Victoria, I think, especially emphasised the importance of look at these structures behind it, coloniality. And you know, to cut a long story short, very simplified, but um, one of the key resources for colonial in the hands of the colonizers of imperial uh, powers was divide and rule. Mm. And I think what I've seen over my lifetime, I'm 62 now, uh, environmental peace movement were in lockstep 70s and 80s. And what we've seen with that movement as well as other movements is this increasing fragmentation. 
and I don't trust it. I think the levels of interference we're hearing about here in universities are even more intense than civil society. And this divide and rule strategy of, of pitting. So for instance, the fact that climate is now such an intensely discrete issue in its own right, hugely important as it is, uh, you know, it's a massively important issue. I've been working on it for 40 years. But the fact that it's now fragmented from other areas so often so that we do find very well motivated activists actually calling for the decarbonization of the military. It's I don't know if they include in that the 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 carbon emitted from incinerated human bodies. I don't know, but that's a that's an actual uh, aim. And I think we've got to recover that. You know, it it was um uh it's it's not just uh, atrophied. It's been deliberately lost so that we now have NGOs that were green and peace and now mm. not. And it's a really stark pattern. So there, I think we have a resource which you the the, the the civilizing effective hypocrisy, as John Elster called it where universities play up do exactly all this greenwash stuff for sustainability, but there are some real traction in sustainable development goals. Goal 16 on peace includes not contributing to arms, uh, mm, arms mm. production. Now, you know, we can dismiss these as being negotiated and, and compromised, or we can use them strategically. They're not the solution, but the SDGs do join things together. They're a great antidote, I think, to this divide and rule because they've unified so many agendas. And they're practically there because universities are desperate that attract students on their sustainability credentials. So I think there are opportunities there that may be not entirely fulfilled to point out how a lot of these things we're talking about here are, are directly infringing on sustainability goals and compromising on universities' claims in that regard. Mm, yeah, yeah, very good point. And Victoria? I just wanted to make a quick uh, sort of point about that because I am... I, um, um... In, in EDR, equality, diversity and inclusion, and you see the universities doing the same thing when it comes to ED, EDI in terms of things like, like pink washing, um, and, es and especially when it comes to militarism. So, for example, you'll have um, recruitment drives that'll be like, hey, come join the army we are the least homophobic <laughs> institution on earth hey come join the R R R have you thought about the raf there used to be blacks black uh RA raf officers in world war mm -hmm. ii and university staff are being sort of pushed more and more through these edi and also fake decolonization initiatives to sort of go and and go down that road, and mm, and mm. and that and I think that's also another very da dangerous uh, road that's taking us to something really sinister. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Thank you. Um, yeah. So still more questions are coming in. We are pretty much out of time. I'm Great, but so sorry to all those who haven't been answered. But I just want to ask one more very quick question from Beth Irving. Are there any examples of universities in the UK that are demilitarized? Anyone know of any? Um, yes, because that's one thing I address in the report. It's hard to um, know exactly what is meant by demilitarization. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, basically, um, if, you, if you mean, um, have there been universities di divested from the arms industry? Mm -hmm. I do bring up examples in that university in, in the report. However, the problem with using that as an indicator is that um, they can still do, um, they still collaborate with the arms industry for research, basically. So. Any, <laughs> any that have, ex have explicitly divested from the arms industry and stated a policy that they will not accept funding from the military or from arms companies um not not that i can think of <laughs> so right. at least not 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 from all three mm. of those indicators no <laughs> yeah so, well yeah. um that means we've all got work to do then and uh all to compete uh to be the first uh so you know nottingham lincoln sussex uh you you you're all uh on 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 call there so thank you very much
to Akopi and to our panelists, Andy, Victoria and River. It's been really, really interesting. And thank you all for coming. Sorry, we've gone slightly over. Please do read the report. Do also um, check up on CAT and on Demilitarized Education. Uh, and um, yes, uh, I, let's... let's uh, I hope that many of you will be getting involved in in campaigning for the for uh, for this demilitarization of universities. Okay, thank you very much, and bye for now. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Sam. Cheers.